come to AGU and learn. And today we're going to hear from Eric Rigneau, who, in case you don't know, is at a professor of Earth System Science at UC Irvine and a principal and investigator at JPL. He began his career studying astronomy and astrophysics, then moved on to aeronautical engineering and electrical engineering, and has been in Southern California pretty much since then, if he's not at the polls. Um, he's really been one of the people who has set the framework for how we understand how the ice sheets are changing by his innovative work on uh, capturing how ice flows and what the ice sheet mass balance is. And you know, he has a very intense nature to him. If you've ever traveled with him, you know, if you've ever ridden on a C-130, you know that they're really noisy and they aren't really conductive to conversation. I think Eric's the only person who ever spent most of the ride back from McMurdo actually talking about science with. <laughs> so I guess give you a sense of um, the intensity he brings to the work. So today we're really, I'm not gonna talk too much longer because we actually wanna have time to hear the, hear the lecture and actually have a chance to pelt him with questions. So he's gonna talk about ice sheet systems and sea level change today. So let's welcome Eric. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, it's an honor to, uh, what? I didn't mean to do that, to give this uh, night lecture. And uh, I want to uh, dedicate to uh, Bob Thomas, another Englishman besides John Nye, who uh, made major contribution to glaciology. Uh, Bob Thomas passed away uh, earlier this year. Uh, he, was, uh, he was there early uh, in my career. He, he helped raise a new generation of glaciologists in his wake. Uh, he put the NASA polar program in orbit where it is, uh, where, where it is now. And this is a picture of him um, on the way to Pine Island Glacier in 2002 on board a, a Chilean Navy P3. Uh, when we reached Pine Island Glacier, I think we beat the world record of the number of people in the cockpit that day. Uh, you'll see more of Bob Thomas. Uh, okay, sorry. You'll see more of Bob Thomas uh, a little bit later on in this, in this talk and, and why his contributions are so relevant to what we're doing today. Uh, so we, we can't talk about uh, uh, ice and sea level without starting by talking about sea ice uh, because sea ice is important. There's also a lot of people out there are still confused when we talk about sea ice and sea level. So we make it clear for the record that sea ice is, is just frozen seawater. It doesn't raise sea level. It's been changing um, very rapidly in the Arctic, 13% per decade, uh, to the point where we can now cross the Northwest Passage on a sailing boat in three weeks, as opposed to three years uh, when it was first done by Royal Amundsen. Uh, that decay of sea ice has very important implication for climate dynamics, and it's uh, it's a complex result of the interaction of warmer air, warmer ocean, the albedo feedback, uh, changes in thickness, uh, changes in transport of the, of the Arctic ice in places like Fram Strait and, and, and so on. Uh, in the southern hemisphere, the sea ice cover, which is mostly seasonal, has been growing about 1% by decade. And every once in a while, that record comes back at the surface of uh, climate deniers that uh, this is uh, calling in question our understanding of uh, climate change. Uh, but this is actually completely compatible uh, with uh, uh, climate warming from greenhouse gases and it has important implication also for, for the land ice. Uh, <clears throat> so in the southern hemisphere we have the westerly regime uh, uh, around the Antarctic continent which drives the climate system down there. And the strength of the westerlies is, is driven by the temperature difference between the Antarctic continent and the rest of the world. It turns out that uh, the rest of the world is warming up faster than Antarctica. There's, there's no uh, albedo feedback in the Antarctic uh, compared to the Arctic. And the ozone hole has, has contributed to the cooling of, uh, of the Antarctic. As a result, uh, Westerlies have been uh, increasing in strength about uh, 30 percent uh, since the 1980s. And as a result of that, uh, it moves the surface waters to the north, that's X-Men transport, 
and that explains the exp slight expansion of the seasonal sea ice. Uh, there's been some studies suggesting that the melting of uh, the Antarctic ice sheet could contribute to that, but uh, most of the meltwater from the Antarctic is actually generated at depth. It's, it's not affecting the surface layers so much. It mixes up with the surrounding ocean water at intermediate depth. So I don't think that's the reason. To compensate for that, um, uh, export of the surface waters northwards, the subsurface waters have to move closer to Antarctica. And uh, <clears throat> That's where the warm waters are. In the tropics, you have warm water at the top and cold water at the bottom. In the polar regions, it's the opposite. We have cold, fresh water at the top and warm water at the bottom. It, it stays there because it's salty. Uh, and it's typically in the Antarctic, uh, uh, four or 500 meters uh, below the surface. Uh, it's, warm is, is a relative term. I, I would not actually take a bath in that. It's about uh, three degree temperature. Uh, and uh, most of that warmth is located in the Antarctic circumpolar current. And you see that uh, there are some places uh, around Antarctica where the current comes pretty close to the coastline. So it doesn't take much uh, for a change in the wind or polar contraction of the austral westerlies to send a little bit more heat onto the continental shelf, which then uh, makes its way to the glaciers and the floating parts of these glaciers to melt them. And this is more or less what we're seeing here with this uh, I set record. There's a more recon, recent record by Paolo and Frico et al. looking at the thinning of the ice shelves around the Antarctic, and not surprisingly, we see most of the floating extension thinning very rapidly where the uh, in closest area to the circumpolar deep water. Uh, <clears throat> yes, uh, let's go back to that uh, for one second. Oh, I think. Um, yeah, so um, in terms of uh, sea level potential and, and mass balance of the ice sheets, we, we have actually uh, been able to make major progress in our understanding of ice sheet mass balance uh, uh, since the 1990s. That's also when uh, Bob Thomas started uh, the Parker program to investigate the mass balance of the green ice sheet. It was based on the suborbital program, but also with connection with satellites like ERS and, and, and uh, later on with uh, ISAT-1. So we have a pretty good idea um, how fast these ice sheets uh, are, are melting away. Uh, we uh, have since 2002 uh, with the GRACE mission, we have monthly reports of the state of health of these ice sheets. It's like the weather report, right, a monthly uh, news on, on what Grace sees in the polar regions. Uh, we know which glaciers are changing, uh, how much they contribute to sea level. We know also the exact partitioning between uh, the changes caused by ice dynamics, which means increased flow of ice towards the ocean, versus surface mass balance processes, uh, which is mostly change in precipitation and, and change in, in, in melt. Um, I've been focusing a lot of my work on um, the ice dynamics part because um, in the long term, uh, in terms of rapid uh, sea level rise, uh, this is the natural vehicle for fast changes. You know, if you speed up the glaciers, you can increase the rate of sea level rise. Um, you cannot do things in a similar way with surface mass balance processes. The vector of rapid change is ice dynamics. Uh, so we map using satellites uh, these glacier velocities and, and, and track them uh, with time. This is coupled with um, measurement of ice thickness from airborne radars from the University of Kansas to measure the fluxes around the periphery. And this is coupled with uh, reconstruction of uh, surface mass balance process in the interior from regional atmospheric climate models. These models were in the infancy in the 1990s and, and uh, within the, by the year 2005-2006 we had very robust reconstructions of surface mass balance going back uh, to IGY that we can use to reconstruct mass balance of the ice sheets. And we have now access also to some of the uh, earlier satellite data uh, from the 60s. So we have potentially a 55-year record, very precise record of uh, what is happening in the ice sheets um, uh, uh, as a result of climate change. Uh, to put some numbers in perspective, uh, <coughs> We have about uh, 57 meters of uh, sea level rise equivalent in the Antarctic, uh, seven in Greenland, 
half a meter from glaciers and ice cap. Out of those, we tend to separate those uh, uh, from marine-based uh, basins. So all these parts that are blue here on this bed map of Greenland and bed map of Antarctica uh, are places where the ice sheet rests on the bed below sea level. So these places are more sensitive to climate change because as the ice retreats, it will be followed by the ocean during its retreat, and the ocean is a large source of heat that uh, uh, melts the, the ice sheet. So there we have a three meters sea level rise from uh, West Antarctica, you see most of it is a marine-based ice sheet, 19 meters from East Antarctica, two meters from uh, Greenland, and not very much from the glaciers and ice cap. To put things in perspective, uh, one meter sea level rise, uh, played with these toys like most of us do, uh, there's no more airport in San Francisco. Um, SFO is below water and Auckland is below water. So we'll have to come to AGU by boat or by car. Um, we also know that uh, because of the deformation of the crust, uh, sea level is actually higher away from the ice sheet. So even though the ice sheets seem so remote from us, they actually raise sea level uh, faster in California than they do along the coast of Greenland and Antarctica, where actually the sea level is going to go down. Uh, I'm going to talk a lot about gigatons uh, in this talk. One gigaton, 10 to about 12 kilo, is a, the consumption of water by a city like Los Angeles, Paris, or San Francisco. I can use that in different city. Um, and 360 gigatons is one millimeter of sea level rise. So of course, in terms of the total ice sheet uh, content, it's it, thousands and thousands of gigatons. Uh, but some of the losses we're talking about ice sheets in, on the human scale, they represent uh, you know, 300 gigatons, 300 times the consumption of water by a city like San Francisco. So at the human scale, the mass loss from this ice sheet is pretty big, but there's still a large amount of ice left in these ice sheets. So we'll start with uh, uh, this drawing from Fiamma Stranio for the, for the cold places in the Antarctic where the Ice flows down these rivers that you saw earlier and develop a floating section, which we call an ice shelf, which shears along the sides and along the bay walls and can be anchored by islands and, and breaks up into these icebergs. This is a, a calving event from Jakob Savan is very here. This is uh, several kilometers in size. Uh, and uh, <coughs> the Melt of the surface, especially in the Antarctic, is very small. Snowfall is also small, tens of centimeters per year to much less than one meter per year. Uh, most of the changes occurring here are from the bottom uh, because the ice melts vigorously in contact with these warm waters. So <clears throat> it does that um, uh, for two reasons. The ocean water is salty. <laughs> uh, that uh, changes the melting point of the melange by two degrees right there. That's why we put, we put salt on the roads. At least that's what we're doing in roads of France when I was a kid, put salt on the road to melt the ice. You get a two degree here for free. And on top of that, the melting point of, uh, of the melange is uh, increasing with pressure. And most of these grounding lines in the Antarctic are about one to two kilometers below sea level. And when you're about 1.3 kilometers below sea level, you get another degree for free of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, additional temperature. So you get a three degree for free when you put the ice at one kilometer depth uh, in contact with the ocean. So there's plenty of heat uh, to melt uh, these uh, floating extensions. And, and we know they melt at rates of meters per year to 10 meters per year to some places 100 meters per year. So uh, much larger rates of uh, turnover than uh, at the surface. It's a bit difficult to measure these, these rates because, of course, if you look from above from satellites, you don't see so much what's going on from below. So you have to do that from mass conservation principle. We look at the flow of ice, the floating ice shelves, the thickness, the change in um, height of the ice shelves from altimetry. And we can look at the exact partitioning of uh, bottom melting and calving to find out that the Antarctic actually a bottom melting dominates. And that means that when this ice reaches the ocean, more than half of it melts away in the ocean right away, and then the rest breaks up into icebergs. You can still read in Encyclopedia that uh, in the Antarctic, mass wastage is from icebergs, but actually half of the story is taking place below uh, the waterline. Um, two places stand out in this map, uh, the Amundsen Sea sector, where the intensity of melt is, is very high, 
And in Eastern Tartic as well, uh, there's uh, the Wilkins Slash Basin where the rates of ice shelf melt are anomalously high compared to, to the norm uh, in the Antarctic. So once you uh, melt away these ice shelves, uh, you remove uh, a plug on the glaciers, and Bob Thomas used to refer to that as a cork, and do a demonstration on stage with a, a wine bottle and unplugging the cork. I'm not going to do that today. But uh, once you remove the ice shelves, uh, the glaciers can flow a lot faster. And we saw that in the Antarctic Peninsula in 2002. They sped up by a factor three to eight. And uh, if you were to do this experiment and speed up all the glaciers around the Antarctic by a factor eight, uh, we would raise sea level by four meters per century. And you can do the calculation yourself. It's uh, 22 100 gigaton per year for the nominal mass flux around the Antarctic. Uh, 360 gigatons is one millimeter, and we'll see what you get for uh, a factor eight. I see some of you are already writing down there. You, you can do the calculations a few times. It, it helps to be sure that you really get four meters per century, but that's what you get. Um, we also know that the shape of the bed is important. We know that since the 70s from the work of uh, Vietman, uh, Terry Hughes, and, and Bob Thomas, uh, when the bed is getting deeper inland, and there's lots of places like that in the Antarctic because you put a four-kilometer piece of ice on top of the crust, and that tends to de depress the crust, especially at the center where the, the mass is, is higher. Uh, when you have a retrograde bed uh, and you start uh, calving away the ice sheet, there's only two stable positions. One is if the ice sheet reaches the edge of the continental shelf, and then it will calve off uh, that, that steep uh, ridge here or the whole ice sheet has to retreat and become a floating ice shelf. Uh, once it starts retreating, uh, the glacier speeds up, the strain rate increases, calving increases, it's uh, changing um, with the cubic of the ice thickness, so it's a nonlinear effect. When the bed is prograde, the rate of retreat uh, is a little bit uh, uh, smaller. So I call that the, the Thomas effect. Um, in a, Peninsula, we saw the dramatic uh, collapse of uh, ice shelves because the surface cracks, you need a bottom crack and a surface crack to uh, destroy an ice shelf. The bottom crack will only raise to sea level and the surface crack will only go down to sea level, but they have to sort of meet if you want to crack the whole thing. Uh, if you fill up the surface crevasse with water, it's going to go to sea level very easily and that's what happened here in the, in the peninsula. And that, created this domino effect that Doug McHale studied and, and the rapid collapse of, uh, of, the, of these ice shelves and then the subsequent increase in speed of these glaciers. Uh, now, we, now that we destroy the ice shelves, we look at the landscape in Greenland, except for the northern part of Greenland, and we have marine terminating glaciers. And uh, something interesting happens there that we, we sort of only understood recently. Uh, so now you're calving off, not from a floating extension, but from a nearly vertical wall. So the, the plume of ice melt uh, mixed up with the ocean doesn't raise along a, a nearly flat horizontal surface. It can rise along a vertical surface. So that makes, that makes the melting uh, more intense. But on top of that, uh, this is a warmer climate, so there's a lot of melting. That melt water goes down these uh, beautiful rivers. This is from, uh, from you, Loy. Uh, uh, f using a rogue, right? Uh, down moulins and then pushed by gravity, it makes its way through cracks and moulins down to the bed and comes out uh, at the periphery at the grounding line of these glaciers. So it's a, it's a plume of fresh cold water. It wants to rise immediately to the surface. It mixes up with the warm water at depth and creates very large melt rate. Melt rates typically of Greenland are five, three to five meters per day in, in the summer, right? Uh, in the Antarctic, it's more like three per five meters per year. So we have another factor 10 going on in the melting uh, of ice in the ocean uh, at, these, uh, uh, at these latitudes. So if the calving speed is also increasing by 10, which might be more or less the case in Greenland, the glaciers go more or less 10 times faster than the Antarctic counterpart, we're, we're okay. We have a good uh, match between the calving speed and the melting speed from the ocean. Um, so the impact of the ocean will be especially sensitive on the slower moving glaciers of Greenland and not as efficient on the glaciers that calve very rapidly and have a calving front determined by, by other factors. So we see here some calving on Helheim from Tavi Murray and others 
And here's some uh, plumes of uh, subglacial water coming out of the front of Kangeta Nunata that create uh, frequent calving because the ice face is undercut by all the ocean melting uh, taking place at depth. Um, once um, we remove the glaciers from the ocean, right, I used to think that we can just relax and take it easy, but the glacier and ice cap record actually shows a different story. Um, there's uh, <coughs> this paper by Chris Larson, uh, published this year on the mass balance of uh, the Alaska glaciers, and there's something really interesting came out of that. You have you have marine terminating glaciers uh, in Alaska that we can all visit uh, to admire the beauty of glaciers uh, during these cruises. They only cover 14% in area of Alaska, but and they contribute only 6% of the total loss. Now, most of the loss is dominated by the land terminating glacier or lake terminating glaciers. So most of the loss of Alaska glaciers, which is a fairly big number, 75 gigatons per year, is from surface mass balance process alone, and, and that means from melt of the ice surface. Uh, there's a study uh, that is presented this afternoon at 5 p.m. by uh, my PhD student, Romain, and some other work published by Canadian counterparts for the Canadian ice, ice caps we have something similar, 30% covered by marine terminal glaciers, but they only contribute 10% of the total loss. So most of this loss is controlled by uh, surface mass balance processes. So now let's look at some numbers from, um, from Isabella Veliconia using GRACE. Uh, this is the decay of mass from the green line sheet, 273 gigatons per year for 2003 to 2015, and an acceleration, which gives this curvature uh, to, um, to that decay here. We have 85 from the Antarctic and 18 gigatons per year square of acceleration. And then we have the glaciers and ice cap uh, about 217 gigaton per year, almost as large as Greenland, and also with an acceleration term. So together, for that time period, 575 gigatons, this is the rate of increase of the mass loss, it changes every year. So if you do the calculation for 2015, that's about 2.3 millimeter per year from all the melting land ice going into the ocean, so it's a pretty big number. Uh, what's interesting is if you uh, scale that mass loss per area, you realize that the process is very inefficient. In the Antarctic, of course, we're melting only a small fraction of, of the Antarctic. Uh, it's a little bit more significant in Greenland where the melting is affecting actually the entire periphery of the ice sheet and much larger on the glaciers and ice cap, right? It's about three times uh, faster uh, contribution to sea level from the glaciers and ice cap. And we can go down the record and find out that uh, actually the place in the world where the glaciers are contributing the most is Patagonia, uh, we have the largest rate of mass loss average per area. Uh, and you see it's about 10 times faster than what we have in Greenland. So in sort of a way, when we make these ice sheets a little bit smaller and they only melt from the top, they're actually still contributing in a very big way to, uh, to sea level. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to uh, not talk about projection of, of sea level rate. Uh, we know that we are sort of... Uh, on a pace right now for a, a one meter per century uh, contribution to sea level from the melting of glaciers, ice sheet and ice cap, you can argue whether this is going to be a linear, like I've been doing over the years, uh, linear increase in mass loss with time. Uh, Jim Manson likes to talk about the doubling every 10 years or a doubling over 20 years. The record is actually not long enough to say who is right. And for sure, we don't want to wait 2100 to figure out who was right. Uh, but I'm going to talk a little bit more in terms of uh, what I would call uh, sea level commitment. So the sort of, of flooding gates that we may have already opened that commit us to a certain amount of sea level. So starting from Greenland, uh, we have three major flood gates at the Jakob Savin Isbray and Central West Coast, the Northeast sector, and then the Peterman Humboldt sector. Uh, <clears throat> Peterman Humboldt contain a 0 0.6 meter sea level equivalent. Jakob 7, 0 0.6, and the northeast side stream, 1.1 meter. That's just one system of two glaciers. Right? Uh, Jakob 7 is very changed, uh, changed very rapidly starting in 2002. There's a lot of papers by Ian Jockin on Jakob 7. It lost its floating ice storm, it tripled its speed. Uh, the glacier, now look at the coastline around Jakob 7, you can see the the ocean, mostly in the coastline and, and getting farther inland, 
we, ex we witness major calving event. This is one calving event this summer that we move huge chunks of ice. So the retreat of this glacier now is really governed by its rate of calving. It's retreating down uh, the equivalent of a Grand Canyon. It's 1.2 kilometers below sea level and it stays below sea level for quite a while. It's even uh, retreating right now in the retrograde part of the, of the bed. So this is probably a case of uh, marine ice sheet instability developing along uh, the channel of Jakob Savan. Of course, there's going to be bumps and hollows along the way that are going to modulate the retreat, but it's, we opened that floodgate um, over here with a 0 0.6 meter potential sea level. And David uh, Holland showed in 2008 that this breakup of the ice tongue coincided with the increase in ocean temperature uh, in the fjord, increased advection of Atlantic water along the coast of Greenland. The second one is Zachary Eastrum. We published a, a, a paper uh, just a couple of months ago uh, on that. This is the Northeast Ice Stream. This is the only feature in Greenland uh, where uh, this, this was first pointed out by Mark Fanstock in the 1990s. Uh, this is the only Antarctic looking ice stream in, uh, in Greenland. And that's indeed a part of Greenland where the climate is similar to the Antarctic. Very, very cold temperature, very low precipitation. So you have this very long ice stream that reaches to the flank of summit. 1.1 uh, meter uh, sea level rise equivalent and most of that is a marine basin. We've been following Zachary since 2004 when we saw its floating ice shelf starting to break up, but it took a little while for this one to fall apart completely. It really started falling apart in 2012. Some of the changes in the ice shelf are actually so large that uh, we don't need laser altimetry. We can directly measure them with our sounding radar. This is the thickness in 99, 2010, and 2014. Look at 200 meters of ice removed here uh, during that time period, uh, which can only be attributed to warmer ocean temperature melting the ice from below. We haven't found uh, ice melting, uh, ice eating whales uh, in Greenland so far, so that's the only physical explanation we have for that. So these glaciers, uh, the Grand has been retreating seven kilometers here. Um, it's sped up by 50 percent. It's getting wider inland and it's, it's going on a linearly flat bed, even retrograde. So we think that the next few decades is going to be a lot of contribution to sea level from from this part of Greenland. The neighboring glacier, Nogalfias uh is not uh, changing speed and retreating. It's actually retreating on a prograde bed, but the ice shelf is, is melting away pretty fast too. Uh, we know from uh, recent work by uh, Fiamma Straneo that it's a little bit more difficult for the Atlantic water to make its way through here. Uh, here we don't exactly know the pathway, but this glacier might be a little bit protected, but it's still losing hundreds of meters of ice. So that floodgate there might open up uh, in, in the near future if the ice shelf continues feeding at that rate. The third one is from uh, Peterman Humboldt. Um, for a long time when I studied Peterman Glacier, the ice front of Peterman was pretty much the same it was in 1901 when Launch Cork mapped it for the first time. He also mapped the grounding line of the glacier and sure enough when we mapped it super precisely with interferometry, uh, what was that, Nin uh, 90 years later it was exactly at the same place. Uh, but that glacier has changed a lot in recent years, and it lost now 40% of its 70-kilometer ice shelf. Uh, there's some places where uh, Andrea Muncho showed with um, radar sounding, we lost big chunks of 250 meters of the ice shelf from warmer ocean temperature. So it might be uh, only a, a matter of time for that floodgate also to open up once that uh, ice shelf gets a bit more fragile. Notice it flows down a deep canyon, so it's, it's sharing a lot on the wall. There's still a lot of resistance to flow from the remaining uh, ice shelf. Going to the Antarctic, uh, I realize I didn't press the button for the time. Ah, that's good, I still have 45 minutes. There's a lot more, there's a lot more flooding gates. I, I didn't count them all because there's too many. Uh, there's some names over here. I'm going to talk mostly about two because they are the ones that are standing out uh, from the altimetry record. The altimetry record has been immensely useful very early on to tell us where the action was taking place. And they did that early on, for instance, on the Totem Glacier, uh, uh, showing that there's something going on before we could even do anything in terms of looking at ice dynamics. So the first one is uh, the much talk about Admiralty Sea Sector, I doubt that you will learn something new from this. Uh, uh, 
Uh, we have the Pine Island, Twaits uh, Basin. These are monster glaciers, right? Twaits is 120 kilometers wide. It discharged 100 gigatons per year of ice, uh, 100 times the consumption of water of San Francisco, right? Just one glacier. Uh, Pine Island discharge almost as much, uh, as much ice, and they lose about 50% of that ice. They discharge 50% too much ice to the ocean compared to what would maintain them in a state of, uh, of equilibrium. So they're big monsters. Their grounding line is retreated about a kilometer per year. For Smith Glacier, it's retreating two kilometers per year. That's probably one of the fastest retreat rate, for sure in the Antarctic, but, uh, but probably in, in all the ice sheets. Uh, Smith is retreating down a two kilometer below sea level trench that goes on for another 35 kilometers. A very nice example of marine instability. This glacier is still retreating in 2015 at two kilometers per year. Uh, what's, what's what we found from the Sentinel data. We spent a lot of time since 2002, not just NASA, but the British Antarctic Survey, University of Texas, a lot of groups mapped the heck out of this place. It was the least well-mapped part of Antarctica. It now is the most well-mapped part of Antarctica. Uh, we reconstructed the bed. This is the work of uh, Mathieu Molligam, uh, combining ice velocity and ice thickness to get some very detailed topographic information to sort of resolve some of the bumps in the bed to see if there's any bumps down upstream that would slow down the retreat. The grounding line of uh, Pine Island is over here. There's no bumps uh, that is gonna slow it down as it goes farther inland. Uh, the same for Smith, uh, the same for Twaits. There's a little bit of a rough landscape here, but if you look in the details, there's some passages, easy passages where it's, it stays really well below sea level and gets deeper inland. Well, that's why we suggested a year and a half ago that the plug had already been removed from that sector and it was, uh, it was gonna retreat slowly until all that ice, that one meter sea level equivalent uh, would, would be gone. And then Totem. Uh, uh, Totem Glacier, uh, there's work from uh, uh, Jimmy Greenbaum that resolved the bathymetry beneath Totem and showed some passages for the warm water to come in. Uh, we've looked at in detail at the topography near Totem. There's, there's an ice plain region, a region where the ice is only a few tens of meters above hydrostatic equilibrium, so it's easy for that uh, zone to transition and modulate the glacier speed. We have now a, a good record of the glacier speed from uh, my PhD student, Shin Lee. She has a a talk about this a little bit later on, uh, going back to the 1990s, uh, which coincide nicely with some of the uh, thermal forcing we constructed from the uh, eco ocean model. Uh, <clears throat> and we have a mass loss from totem driven a little bit by surface mass balance in green and, uh, and a lot by the discharge here in blue. Uh, the bed becomes prograde upstream of that region. So it's, that bed is, is a bit protected from a rapid collapse compared to uh, the Amundsen Sea sector. But that glacier alone has a 3.9 meter sea level equivalent. That is bigger than all of West Antarctica, just one glacier. So uh, we, we don't want to tease that guy too much, right? Uh, <clears throat> I'm not talking about models, just, uh, I just have one view graph. Um, I, I was really hopeful that we would make some major breakthrough with models uh, some years ago. Um, I'm, I, I've gone a little bit less optimistic because we're facing so many different challenges uh, with these models. Uh, one of them is to model the ocean forcing. Right? You have to run these models at high resolution to replicate the eddies and the transport of, of ocean heat along some pathways. Uh, when we get, um, oh, I didn't start this simulation here, but um, when we look at the melting along the ice face, there's supposed to be a movie here, but sorry. Um, we're looking at a plume of melt that we uh, replicate in models when we operate the models uh, at, at one meter resolution. We have to take into account the undercutting of these uh, ice faces. We have to map the bathymetry along the coast of the ice sheets. Most of these have never been mapped before. Uh, we have to figure out the rate of basal friction uh, uh, underneath the ice sheets, something that we can't observe from above. And then we have to Look at calving laws. There's a lot of work's been done by David Porter and Al looking at different calving laws to see what would be needed to uh, trigger some collapse in some parts of Antarctica. The calving law is really important. That can make the difference for Pine Island Basin between withdrawing the, the ice in a few centuries or in one century. Right? This is the range of uncertainty that we have. So there's a lot of progress done with these models, but it's difficult at this point to use them 
to make a realistic uh, uh, projection of the, of the rate of sea level. I'm hopeful, however, that we'll make progress on that, but time is sort of running out with some of these issues. There's a lot of interesting things that came from the paleo record. So right now we are on one meter per century. Uh, 14,000 years ago, we know that sea level was able to raise four meters per century. And we have the paleo record from the interglacial that suggests with uh, one degree to two degree above pre-industrial, we are committed to six to nine meters sea level rise. So that means part of Greenland, part of Antarctica, uh, melts away uh, with that kind of a temperature change. There's the work of uh, Leverman that showed we commit to a 2.3 meters sea level rise per degree above pre-industrial. So if we, there's been a lot of talk about the two degree limit here that, that takes us to four meters sea level rise. Right? Uh, this study suggests maybe six to nine meters sea level rise with a two degree above pre-industrial. So to conclude, um, Large control of SMB on glaciers and ice cap. Um, I try to explain a little bit why ice ocean interactions are so important in triggering changes, especially in the Antarctic and the periphery of Greenland. But once these glaciers uh, lose contact with the ocean, they still, they still melt very rapidly. And for the fast rates of retreat, we really need to make more progress on the rates of calving. We, we've never seen uh, a marine ice sheet collapse in the past. Right? There's no record of that. There's nothing we can compare it with to say we're right. Uh, and, and we can't quite afford to see an ice sheet collapse uh, to figure that out. Uh, numerical models face tremendous challenge, but I think we've, we've made a lot of progress in terms of the commitment to sea level rise that, we, uh, that, that are relevant. Right? Some of the floodgates that we open that commit us down the line uh, to some amount of sea level rise. I think this is more important because we know the climate regime is not going to reverse itself even if we change to a carbon-free economy tomorrow. Uh, and we all do like Elon Musk said we should do, which is great. Um, so we are committing ourselves to a number of meters of sea level rise. The time scale, of course, is important for, for people who want to plan things. Uh, but the commitment down the line may be more important. And we can come up with some hard numbers on that. At least I'm trying to do that. Uh, one meter from the Amazon Sea which would then train the retrieval of the retreat of all the Western Antarctic ice sheet and its three meter sea level rise. The Greenland Marine Basin, probably half of them are already committed right now and the other half is changing rapidly. That's another two meter of sea level rise. And then there's the Wilkes land sector. I only talked about Totem, but there's a few others in that region that we should uh, keep under a close watch. There's been a lot of talk about Paris going to 1.5 degrees instead of 2 degrees, which is, which is great, right? It's going the right way <laughs> instead of going the other way. Um, I'm not sure, clear, so sure that from the viewpoint of sea level rise from ice sheet, this is going to take us to a safe place at all, right? Uh, some, we've been talking in the past about the point of no return or thresholds. I think a lot of what we're seeing in the ice sheets today are telling us uh, the threshold we, we kind of passed it already, right? We opened a bunch of floodgates already on these ice sheets. It's not exactly clear how we can close them up. And I'll end up with this nice cartoon of what our future looks like. Thank you very much. Okay, we have time for questions, and if you have questions, could you come up to the mic, um, please, so we can all hear you? Oh, you can come here if you want. You want to come here? Let's come here. <laughs> come, come here. Or you can, or you can ask him. Okay. Uh, 
Ah, good question. Um, could the rapid change in sea ice uh, affect the way uh, the land ice is melting away? I don't know. It's a good question. We know, we know in the Antarctic there's a number of studies that illustrate the complex interplay of sea ice and the intrusion of, of warm water. It, it modulates the intrusion of warm water. In Greenland, I, I, I don't know, I'm sorry. The thermal expansion? Oh, the spatial variability in sea level rise? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question for people looking at sea level fingerprints, right? Uh, sea level rise is not uniform. It depends on the sources of sea level. And I showed one view graph about that, that is rising more rapidly in equatorial regions than close to the, to the poles. It depends whether it's Antarctica and Greenland or the mountain glaciers. Uh, so that's, of course, a topic of great interest. You don't care about global sea level rise. You want to know what it's going to be at home, right? So there's a lot of spatial variability, absolutely. I can't see it. Yeah. Okay. 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 Just.